Welcome to Story Comic Presents, where we interview amazing storytellers and artists. This is episode 72. I am your host, Barney Smith of StoryComic.com, and we are excited to have with us the highly talented and internationally revered comic artist and graphic designer, Seth Martell. Seth, thanks for coming. Morning. Yeah. Thanks. thanks for having me tonight. How you're you're good welcome. To be here. Yeah, we got Stephanie just saying she just said woot, so we know she's watching. Hey Stephanie. <laughs> so this is great, and I and I know with uh, you know with uh, you know Stephanie watching. She when I interviewed her a few months ago, I said you know it was, a, it was a great interview, and I said, and she you know she recommended. She said reach out to Seth. Seth has a lot of has a lot of good things to talk about. So, um, and and thank you for answering your email too. But I appreciate that, Seth. So that was good. <laughs> <laughs> who is this guy yeah no, no so i appreciate that you answered it and didn't uh i, I watched yeah. i watched the whole interview i've watched a bunch of uh, your interviews now but i was there for stephanie's live too it was yeah. uh, it was it was great yeah thank you yeah no yeah it was good so be, before we, we jump in because i as i you know I, I got on i got a nice list of questions for you and 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 i know we have a we have a lot of things to talk about so for the folks that uh that haven't seen your work through uh graphics monday or uh uh or the unlikely hero studios that are familiar with some of your some of your work and some of your other work. Uh, do you want to kind of give people a, a quick background on how you got into comic book art and, and also graphic design? Sure. Uh, you know, I like so many artists, I was a comic book fan growing up mm. and I really did enjoy just reading comics and making as many stories as I could drawing every ounce of free time that I had, I, you know, I, my head was, down, you know, with, with pencils and paper. But then, you know, as I got a little bit older, I started trying to think of how I would make a practical career out of it. Cause like I said to you earlier, I was just born an old man and I was worried that <laughs> how would I ever pay bills? So, uh, you know, I went to school for graphic design and I, I really enjoy graphic design too. So it was never an issue. I always really, really liked it, but, um, you know, graphic design is, is structured and you have so much more freedom with actually drawing with, you know, pen and paper or, you know, really with just with using your hands in a different way than the structure of, of design itself. Hmm. And, um, you know, I started looking for creative outlets and actually before going back to comics, I first started working for probably about seven years. I was working at a haunted house and I was doing uh, set painting and uh, makeup every night and helping plan out the attractions. And that was actually, in a really weird way, kind of like tangentially related to comics because you were planning characters, putting kids in rooms, you know, actually assigning roles and and building environments. And that's a lot like the storytelling related to comics. Um, so the one thing about it though that got frustrating is it's like the, the haunted house is, it's just so ephemeral. Like it, it lasts for that season and then it's gone and you start from scratch. And that's really cool in a way, but also, you know, you really only just have like memories and a few pictures from it. And I, I really started missing having like something tangible in my hand that like I actually did work on and got to finish and create. So mm -hmm. I started drawing again and I wasn't really drawing with the idea of comics at first, but I just was really drawing to have something real and, and, and something I could hold on to. And then I started uh, trying to remember really why I started picking up graphic novels again. And I just started picking some up and, uh, then just decided it, you know, it was time that I started drawing and and putting it to like a real memorable, holdable thing again that I, I actually had created. And and so as, as you brought up, do you do you consider as also that when you put together that that comic book when you're when you mentioned it when you started talking about that, how important did your graphic design background affect the style of your comic book art? You know, I think basic fundamental principle, you know, all the principles of design that you learn, um, you know, a lot of them are just intrinsic. You, you kind of know them when you just understand composition on a page. Mm. And it's just trying to teach someone's eyes how to follow the story. But it's also the same thing when you're trying to get them to follow the story down a postcard or trying to teach them how to follow the story down a flyer or a brochure you're creating. You know, it's, it's, getting someone to start in one place and finish where you want them to finish. 
Right. And, um, you know, besides just the actual composition, you know, the practical things about design of like understanding the software it takes and understanding size specs and how things will reproduce, understanding, uh, you know, color reproduction, those types of things that you learn without even really meaning to in graphic design, like it slowly just becomes like part of part and parcel of, of, of creating all of your products. It helps you so much when you're actually working in comics to know how things will like how the end product will will make its way onto paper. So would you say like a good recommendation and 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 we're looking at these are the uh, the storyboards for uh, and this is for Andromeda, correct? Correct, yep. Okay. And do you say so for for instance would you recommend anybody that's going into comic book art to uh that's doing comics and designing comics that there has to be a there has to be a graphic design component in, in that education. You know, the thing about comics is nothing has to be any certain way, which mm -hmm. is like the, the, the greatest part about it is you yeah. could make anything you want. And as, as long as you're telling the story you want to tell, it's, it's, it's a comic for you. You know, you have, you're telling a story and that's really awesome. But if you're really trying to, I think probably take more traditional roots and, and have more traditional products, it really helps. It does help a lot. Mm. A lot of questions are answered that you would just know with the experience of, of being a graphic designer. And how much? Because I love how even uh, what one of the one of the aspects that I that I love about your design on that is there you seem to take the entire page and look at it as as almost as like one piece of art, one piece of design, where you actually kind of have the frames uh, work to help tell the story. How often do you see? Is, would that be a recommendation when you're when you're you know talking to other up and coming artists? Is like, do you recommend like like looking at frame per frame, for instance, like in our Instagram world, everything say hey if for reproduction values. If you want to tell a sequential story, keep it in a square. That way, people can flip through. How what would be your recommendation on if you're looking at some of the long form stuff? Is uh, is what, what's the what's the give and take on that on looking at like full page designs you know if you zoom out on your page that you've just drawn and if you can draw a paper sorry excuse me if you can draw a line that follows where you want the viewer's eye to go then it's a, it's a successful page mm -hmm. um if you know if you're just drawing a line straight down the page that's not exciting it's not taking up the space that you really want to take you know if someone's going to buy your book don't want them to flip through it in two seconds because all they did was read straight down the middle. Right. You know, you really want to take up, you're, you're given this real estate. You really want to make the best use of it. Mm. And how much, cause you also do lettering as well. And how important is to make sure the frame, the word bubbles, the, the, the lettering itself, how much of that where you want to like, you, you take that step back and make sure everything seems to be connected and what kind of advice would you give to um, other artists about that? You know, I'm an accidental letterer or maybe just like a letterer at a necessity. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm doing essentially lettering every day in my graphic design job. So it's just like, well, I can do this. And for me, you know, with the creation process, somebody like Stephanie, you know, she's pre-writing scripts, which is great. But then it's really nice to have the ability to just one on one say, hey, this takes up an awful lot of space here. Can we split it up? I'll show you how it looks. And you have that back and forth. You know, conversation then where you can instantly try to fit it in in the way that you're not disrupting the flow but still getting the story across hmm. and uh second secondly for myself when i'm working on my own comics if i'm lettering it myself i can just revise on the fly but i'm also writing i'm writing script that way because i don't write script in a traditional way where it's all pre-written i'm actually doing plot beats and notes and then doing the script on the page so let me ask you this. So how important uh, is it to have that, that relationship with, uh, uh, with the writer on that? How, when, when you're, when you sit down and as we, you know, mentioned, for instance, Andromeda, which was written by Stephanie uh, um, and oh, we'll talk about that. So that was written by Stephanie. Um, how much of that back and forth is there when, when you get the script to say, this is what I, and you kind of give that when you kind of give the storyboards, do you give the storyboards out to her first? And then there's a back and forth on that or how much we laid, how much 
direction do you expect from a writer and how much do you say thank you but this is kind of my yeah so um, side of things. sorry yeah no, that's good yeah. yeah so i think a big part of it is stephanie is just such a really great and flexible writer and collaborator um she so that second panel right there she actually had i had shown her thumbnails that i i didn't fit into there because they're just beyond really on unintelligible thumbnails. <laughs> and uh, the second one that I, I showed her there, she uh, did a draw over uh, for me. And it was so helpful because when you have somebody who's really willing to take the time to do that, you're both going to get the product you want. Like you want to tell, you want to tell the right story. You want to tell the story with the best impact you can. And you want to help the writer get on the page exactly what's in their head. Um, especially if they, they really have a clear idea in their mind's eye of what it should be. And, so, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was just going to say, so that's like a slightly refined, but still really rough version. And that, that's the type of one where I can actually start laying in letters and show people how, how much real estate that letter box or the, the word, word bubble will take up. And have you ever, you know, you know, working with uh, maybe other writers who might not understand how page layout happens and they're like, hey, can you make this bigger, make this smaller, can you do this? And then how often do you have to say, well, we have to put in enough space for the words as well. How how much of a conversation do you have to have with writers like that? It can be rough. And like those, <laughs> <laughs> you know, those comics aren't successful. And that's why you don't always, you know, that's why you're not seeing them right now. Because <laughs> sometimes they're not good. They don't really go anywhere. You know, they're just, if someone, if a, if a writer is too held up on only one way to tell the story and can't see around it, right. um, they, it it doesn't mean that no one can tell their story. It just means that they're that they're losing out on a, a really interesting part of the collaboration. Right. And and do you see like differences as well when it comes to you know like you know comic writers? Do you have, do you ever have to kind of help sit down with them and say hey? this is a little more descriptive than you need to. I can draw this. You don't need to have this written out. How, how often does that happen? Uh, you know, the hardest part is teaching people that are writers who don't have a lot of experience that you're not writing um, something uh, in motion. You're not, you're not writing a movie script. You know, someone in one panel can't turn around, but then open the door and front of them while tying their shoe. You can't have multiple direction, you know, angles happening. And even though that could be something that could happen live, you know, right. you have to have a very stopped feeling that, you know, moves little by little. It doesn't mean that it can't happen off panel and you can't figure out ways around it or you can't try to make it work. But sometimes you read a script and you're like, oh no, there's too many things happening here. <laughs> So, so do you see that kind of like as a, that? That's a growing process of it. In in you know, once you know you you know you you kind of create a good rhythm with a with a writer. Do you try to kind of stay connected with them to say, hey, let me know when your next one's coming out, or let me know if there's something else I can do, or how does that relationship kind of bud? And how do you? Uh, and and what do you do when you work with some writers who really like your work, but you're like. Thanks, but um, <laughs> how does that work? I guess. You know, it's you always weigh your options. You know, <laughs> every every job is like, well, what's you know, what's it going to pay? How long is it going to take? Like, what type of time investment is like? What's the return on investment versus like the pain points that you're really going to encounter? Right. Um, it's just like it's just like any freelance job you're going to take. But and some people you really like but they're not necessarily people that you want to work with. And then the people that you find that are just really great collaborators, that's why you see me working with Stephanie all the time. You know, if she, we had finished um, COVID, the COVID Chronicles entry and we both have bigger projects that we're trying to work on. And then she saw this story call for entries for Andromeda in, in Mermaids Monthly. And she's like, hey, do you want to do this? And I said, sure. <laughs> not, just because I know that it's going to be such a fun experience. You know, if, if you have somebody that you can really enjoy that back and forth, it makes it fun and, and pausing other projects for a great experience that those are the things that are worth it. And, you know, you don't even know sometimes if it's going to get picked up, but if you're making something you enjoy, I think that that's 
far more important in, in the end because your, your end product shows the fun that you had. Mm. And so, yeah. So you, you mentioned that is like, so what do you do in those situations where, what would be your advice for the artists that say, you know, a couple of years that they have, they have a good setup with uh, you know, with it, with a writer uh, at what point do you, do you always could try to keep making sure that there's still, cause this is, this is a job that pays that you have to make sure there's contracts involved or when you're working with somebody, you say, all right, you know, we've, we've established a, a good working relationship. Do you ever get laxed on any of that stuff or how does that work? Yeah. Contracts are really important. Um, you know, it depends of course the relationship, but you know, most of the time it's really just safest because it keeps, it keeps friendships healthy and it keeps friendships, you know, cut and dry. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, you know, in the past, yeah, I definitely have been, I've definitely been screwed over by not having contracts in place by promises that really actually were developing, you know, even with, uh, like, you know, editors that had been hired that were exciting to work with and, mm -hmm. um, you know, creative teams that were getting put together. So you can't always, you can't let that kind of like that, that glitter and excitement, uh, totally confused, you know, it, it can distract you because right. you're so excited and you're so hungry to work with on a project that you're very, um, you're stoked to be part of, but that doesn't mean that it's ever going to come to fruition. It doesn't mean that uh, someone or like whoever is financially backing it won't just decide to stop in the middle of it, you know? Right. So you need, you need to have something in place that says what will happen in each stage of that if it, if something changes. Right. And have you been, and you know, you know, with that said, what would be a timeline for you to say, all right, uh, like what, what would be the, the amount of like pages per, um, for how long it would take? Like, Hey, if this is a six pager, then, you know, I need this much in advance. This, if this is going to be a whole, you know, 32 pager, I'll need this much time in advance. How, what, how would you gauge that? What would be your advice for, for artists who are working on those contracts? You know, it's interesting. I, I listened to some of your other um, podcasts and you had someone on before named Danusha and she was very cut and dry with how she, she did things. So it was very smart, um, but it is, it's a little bit different for everybody, you know, and she talked about how, you know, the flexibility is like how you, how you're gauging your own time and what you want to work on and what will this afford you to do something else. And it really is a balancing act. It, you really have to find what will keep you happy, what will keep, what will keep you paid and what, you know, what's paying for the, the things that, um, you know, like the, the tools that you use aren't always cheap, you know, like what's paying for your, your iPad upgrade to make sure that you're, you know, providing the best art or what's, um, you know, what's paying for some people are just relying on freelance art to pay the bills. And that's, that's really tough too. You know, I have a I have a nine to five job, so I, I only have a certain amount of time. So I know for me, I'm only taking on jobs that I enjoy and I can afford that, but I also only have a certain amount of time. So I can't take on every fun job too. I have to be really careful with how I, how I use my time. So yeah, you brought up, so I'm curious to let, you know talk about your, your style and how you actually create your work. Are you all uh, digital or you do a lot of uh, pen and ink or how do you, how do you come up with the, your work? Um, you know, I'm almost entirely digital, but I, I can show you, like, this is where I start. Okay. So I start thumbnails on a, you know, I'm starting thumbnails on a pretty simple page. And right. that helps me kind of figure out the amount of space I'm taking up and still gives you, like, the old-fashioned, you know, pencil on paper feeling that I, I think I need for the composition, like, for true composition. Uh, after that, then I can move to digital and I have a... Um, I have an iPad Pro, and what I like about it is the texture that you can, the depth you can give in with like the the different washes that afford you that feeling of like there's depth and there's lighting, and you can kind of think about how you're going to use lighting in your to your benefit. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to pull out a brush and, and water, you know, like it's it's really helpful in that way where you can get get effects and you can get the looks that you're, you're trying to go for uh, without actually having to do it in the, the middle, the middle phases. 
It, it, do you use, is it, you use Procreate for this or? I did use Procreate for it. I've used uh, Clip Studio as well and Photoshop, but uh, Procreate was the one for this, this one. Okay. And so, and, and through there, do you then, do you export it to another thing to put in the, the words or do you all, is it all you do that through Procreate? No, I, uh, I airdrop all my files into InDesign and okay. um, build a document depending on, you know, whatever, uh, whatever the call for submissions actually gives you for specs, uh, you know, and then I create the specs up in InDesign. Then I can letter and I can know exactly how big the, the letters will be on the page because that's really important. And you can't take it for granted. It's just your letters have to be legible. They can't be huge and they can't be too small. <laughs> like the amount of times that you see, you know, new letterers or really the people who really don't know about lettering, making things far too tiny, that yeah. it's it's such a shame because you're losing so much of the story. And no one wants to put on glasses to read your story. You know, they don't want to sit there with their nose in a book trying to, you know, trying to read it. It's going to give them a headache and they're going to give up. And it doesn't matter how good the art is. You know, they're just going to flip through it and call it a day. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so you you do the lettering in InDesign? I do. A lot of people use Illustrator, but I found that oh. InDesign has enough uh, Pathfinder options that I can actually float them over like a new layer. And um, I actually, I think just because I spend so much of my time in InDesign, I've really become fast at it. Um, as opposed to, you know, and I really like seeing the the page layout where it's actually like, you know, bookended and, right. um, you know, having the facing pages where you can see how it will look as you kind of flip through. I find that really important to make sure that your, um, you know, that your flips are, are, are correct. You know, your story beats are, are on the right pages that you want them to be. So, you know, in a short story, it's not as big of a deal, but you still want to make sure that all of your panels, you know, you don't want to have the same panel across the entire book. You want to make sure that there's a lot of variation. Mm. You just and, don't want people to get bored. Right. So, so talk to us a bit about, so we mentioned before we got on the air that uh, you've been great at connecting to different aspects of the comic book world. You're with, you know, Graphics Mundi, um, Unlikely Hero Studios, which, well, it's just successfully uh, had their Kickstarter. Um, yep. And fully funded, which is awesome. Full, they're, those, those guys are hustlers. Yeah, they're, that's a, a great team to work with. Uh, they they know what they're doing, and they're they're really good at putting it together and, and drumming up you know the the right amount of attention and talking about strategy to to make sure they're they're great at communicating too. So highly recommend that. Highly recommend working with them. So how was it different between that you see working on say like an anthology series like you know COVID Chronicles or elsewhere Volume Two? Uh, some. Uh, compared to some of your other work where it was just a kind of a singular story that was, uh, how would you compare, uh, uh, you know, drawbacks, benefits of doing anthologies versus single stories? Sure. So the, the three stories that you're just mentioning, they were all part of um, anthologies or, uh, you know, mixed with speculative fiction or, you know, different one, you know, one was in a magazine. So they're all, they're all a little bit shorter. Mm -hmm. And I, I really, um, I, I enjoyed them because I, I like them because they're a, a break from your everyday larger works that you're working on. And I don't know if it's for everybody because I think for some people it can be a distraction, but I think if I'm working on two projects at once, I like each of them so much because I can get tired of one and then jump to the other because it's a nice distraction. Hmm. And it keeps my, it keeps my interest and it keeps my, um, keeps my momentum going. Hmm. So the, each of these companies though, were, were interesting because one was a Kickstarter, one was a, a call for submissions that um, was just paying you for use of the, the book, uh, paying you for use of your story once you, uh, you know, just get approved or not approved. And then the other one was a fundraiser. The COVID Chronicles is actually a fundraiser, um, which uh, was going towards uh, uh, bookstores that were suffering during the, the last year. For, for COVID, um, but it was, you know, through a university press and that that was also a, a really cool and interesting group to work with because they're, you know, they're working on a, a different style of book. It's a little bit, it's a little bit quieter. It's a little bit more um, academic, but, mm. um, you know, no less fun to work for. They're, they're really interesting products that they, they make. They, they're just, uh, it's just uh, each one is still telling a story, you know, so I, I, I really enjoy all of them. 
So which one do you do you have a, a a specific type of genre comic that you prefer, whether it be the slice of life stuff or the or the sci-fi or which would do you, do you kind of is there anything that you you when you talk about projects that are fun to work on? Is there anyone that like if you have like three like a fantasy superhero slice of life stuff that kind of like put on your plate? I'll have the same thing. Is there one genre that you will kind of always type of lean towards? Yeah, I, I definitely think that if there's a supernatural horror element, I take to it if somebody oh, really? pitches it to me. Yeah, I think it's just so long working in the haunted house industry. You know, I, I can't <laughs> I can't quite help it. And there's really not like, you know, the two out of those three that you had there um, were um, definitely a little bit more on that side. I haven't done any like full on horror, but, um, you know, the the book that I'm working on, like the, the larger scale graphic novel has some, you know, kind of like supernatural suspense elements to it. And it's not like the heart of the book. The heart of the book really is kind of like a coming of age story, but I, I just kind of feel like for me, that's like what keeps my interest as a reader. So it's, it, it's got to keep my interest as an illustrator too. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you, you did, so the mayor, is that the one that you were talking about? Yeah, that's, that's uh, the graphic novel I'm working on right now. It's, um, it's about, it looks like it's going to be about four chapters worth, uh, somewhere around like the high 80s pages or so. I've, I've thumbnailed all the pages. I've, I've got it working its way through right now. And, um, you know, part of that came about just because while I was doing these smaller stories, I needed something consistent to work on. You know, we've all been stuck home during this last year and I needed like, I needed a project that kind of like had some sort of like, like almost like comfort food drawing, something that felt like connected to. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a child of the nineties. So like, I, I really wanted to kind of take it back to something that felt like it felt familiar. And like, I could listen to, to music. I really, you know, was nostalgic for, it wasn't something I listened to every day, but like picking up some back, you know, old ideas. And, um, you know, just reminded me of like what, what really inspired me when I first started picking up graphic novels after I kind of got not over superheroes, but just like my, my natural next step. Um, so it kind of thought made me think of uh, like Neil Gaiman's Sandman and like death and okay. high cost of living. Yeah. And I, yeah. I just loved, I loved his books, how they were just, there was a whole world of, um, you know, slightly bizarre and off things happening around very normal people. And I, I think that's where, I always like to find it because the world is, is pretty weird. So, <laughs> you know, when you're, you're taking a look around you and you see, you see all this, you know, you see what just doesn't quite make sense. And you, you try to kind of put a little spin on it to make it fun or you make it kind of fantastic or, or, or strange. And um, it, it makes you want to know a little bit more, you know? So, you know, I, I kind of took the main character back to a time of like, you know, that like teen angst, like, feeling of like you're you're lost after high school and so many people around you feel like they know exactly what they're going to do and it makes you feel a little left behind and um also i think the biggest thing for me was uh you know i'm not you know i, I get to work with really amazing writers who have these brilliant you know complex co complex worlds that i don't think my mind works in that way so like i get excited when i get to work with other writers like stephanie and um because that it opens doors to things that I wouldn't normally do. So then when I come back to my own, I try to remind myself, like, don't make things too complicated. Keep it simple. Like, do something you enjoy. So it always feels like something you're going to like when you're picking up your pen, you know? Mm. Have you been able to reach out? Because as you're talking about this, the, the mayor is a book that you're writing and you're, and you're, and you're illustrating as well. And have you had... Have you learned something from? Have you have you learned something that uh, from other writers on how to script it out? Uh, since we're working with others, for sure. And I think more than that, I think peer review is so important. You know, mm -hmm. finding people you trust that you respect their opinion, that understand it, how to critique you, because everybody takes critiques in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't. You know, I think after, you know, going to art school where you're pretty picked apart, you're like, I, I have a pretty thick skin, but that doesn't work for everybody. And so you really need to find the right circle around you that that can tell you 
the things you need to hear, but tell it to you in, like in the way that you need to hear it, you know? <laughs> uh, Stephanie just uh, said the mayor is very layered and complex and splendid. Can't wait. So ah, thanks, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't wait to finish it. <laughs> <laughs> so with your planning, you mentioned there's going to be like, uh, are you planning on splitting it out into separate issues and maybe like in three volumes and then trying to do a you know, Kickstarter for each one or how, what's your plan on that? It could be four issues. I wrote it in four chapters. Um, it, it could be issues because they're in like the 20 count each in the chapters. And I think, you know, as much as I'm trying to write a straight up graphic novel, I think there's just something that hits me in so many years of being trained by trades that just kind of give you that idea of how to pace things. Right. Um, but that, doesn't mean that it wouldn't read well all the way from start to finish. And if that was the, if that was the end place it, it went, I would be totally okay with it too. Yeah. I think there's something really nice about having just that chunk in your hand. And I know as an adult, like sometimes I'm just not really patient or don't have the time to read a little, you know, an issue at a time. And I really, I'm appreciating the, the awesome, you know, afternoon of just you know indulging in a graphic novel it's it's really nice yeah <laughs> and so talk to us a bit about because uh, you know using procreate on the and you did you use procreate on uh on the mayor as well that's what it did yep yeah. okay now how important is it from the graphic design perspective to make sure that there's you know the same that like the the color palette how important would you recommend to artists is like you know making sure that colors match, making sure that, uh, that that's actually part of the, the design too. Yeah. You know, I, I think one of the things that I'm realizing, I shouldn't say realizing, I definitely, I definitely have always known I'm not bad at color and I can pick out colors, but a colorist is a completely different thing. So I okay. can understand the thematic colors. I think I'm actually, I think I'm good at, but being a true colorist, there are people who, really study and and deserve all of the credit for setting a different tone for the story that you may not think of yourself. And uh, right now I have it in black and white and it might stay in black and white, but hiring a colorist is one of my options too that I think could be a really great, really great option. Um, for me, one of the things is, as you saw, like on the earlier page, how things were blue and on the cover things are blue. Right. The the whole thing is the mayor. The mayor, you know, is, is short for nightmare, and part of it is like related to just like old folklore. Um, you know, it's it's about you know the mayor is a restless spirit that that harasses you in the night, and you don't know what is really causing it. You know, it's it's always kind of related to like in mo in modern times, it's related to uh, sleep paralysis, mm. and that's what people kind of attribute the modern version of like where the folklore came from, and. I, I wanted to signify in a way, even if it wasn't necessarily such a dramatic thing happening around the character as they fell asleep, the blue creeping into their life, you know, either it makes them sleepy or they're really suffering from kind of like this, this point in time of feeling trapped, like sleep paralysis makes you feel trapped. And so I'm using it kind of as a, um, a color signifier through, through the book. And, and then like some of your other work that you've done with, with, uh, uh, your other projects through you know elsewhere volume two and COVID chronicles and things like that um how, how deliberate are you also with that um with those those color palettes yeah that the in the um in small acts in COVID, Chron COVID chronicles uh that was actually stephanie's idea for the the cue of how to handle it because in her story especially in the beginning of when COVID was affecting everyone, the world was feeling very bleak and mm -hmm. the world was pretty gray. And she was trying to remind everyone in the story how all these little things in your life are still there to appreciate. And all the little things you do, other people are also appreciating. And those are the small bits of color that are showing in the story around a, a very bleak world. So you know, it, it was dedicated to her husband, who is a, 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 a physician uh, who works with COVID patients and also just how the little things he was doing and the little things he was appreciating around him in his life were bringing color to his world, even though it was still such a tough time. And I got to say, it seems like Zoe is like one of your trademarks is having always that horizontal 
frame. Is that something that you've always either just by happenstance put in or this, are you deliberate to making sure you always have like a horizontal frame? It seems like, ha, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the graphic designer in you that wants to make sure there's, you know, there seems to be some flow like that? Maybe, maybe, yeah. you know, I, I think, I don't necessarily think I know what I'm doing all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think about how I'm, you know, going to try to cover what I want to cover within the story and get these, um, you know, get the eye to move across the page. And so um, it, it's, it's always interesting when somebody else looks at what you've done because, you know, you, you know, when you're actually the illustrator, you have an idea of how you're trying to get your point across, but maybe you can't see the forest for the trees because you spent so much time with it, which is a really awesome and important reason you need really great editors and really great collaborators to say, hey, did you see what you've done here? <laughs> so so talk to us a bit about the um, those connections you've made. As you said, you, 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 you work with Graphics Mundi, Unlikely Hero Studios. What would be your advice for artists who are wanting to get in the field and saying, how did you, especially, you know, for the 2020, there wasn't a lot of conventions. There wasn't the ways that people would normally connect and network just frankly didn't exist. So sure. what would be some of the advice that you would give to um, artists that are you know coming out of art school or, or people that are wanting to get back into it? What would be some of your advice for them? I mean, so much of it, you have to take a, a step back and think of how you thrive. Like where do you do best? Um, you know, in person is, clearly not an option right now, but there, there are so many resources online. We're very lucky now, you know, back when, back when we were younger, these, these options really weren't out there in the type of tangible way that they are now. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, amazing artist resources like, uh, create uh, the comics experience is, a uh, it's an online school, but also offers a uh, creators workshops where you can go and, you know, you can post your work online and, and co-critique you know, which is really helpful uh, mm. for people. I, I was a member there for a very long time. And that's actually where I met Stephanie. And, you know, part of it is you can, you know, you can see what other people are posting and learn about their style, learn about their critique style. And, um, you know, I thought for me personally, like as I was meeting her, I, I saw how she was thoughtfully critiquing. Not only was she talented, but she was taking time to think about how she was delivering information to somebody else. And that's somebody you want to work with. Right. Um, there's also really great Discord channels out there that you can find, you know, through Twitter groups or um, I don't really know any through Facebook, but I've heard that there's some really decent Facebook groups out there as well. I just haven't mm -hmm. been on, on there as much. Yeah. And yet you mentioned Twitter. That seems to be like your main social network. You're, so would you recommend Twitter over say like Instagram or Facebook or for, for instance, for, for connecting with other artists? You know, it's all an experiment that you have to see where you kind of make your best inroads. Mm -hmm. um, and in my day job, besides being a graphic designer, I also manage our social media account. And um, it is interesting to see how different uh, my my day job social media account does in different platforms. It, it doesn't really do as well in Twitter, but it does amazing in, in uh, Instagram. Mm -hmm. And our, our following has just increased exponentially over the last year. And a, a big part of it is how are you going to post and how are you going to interact? Um, you know, Instagram really rewards, you know, consistency and interactivity and, um, you know, Twitter, you, you really want people to, you know, are, are you ready to be in every conversation there? Are you, are you ready to actively talk to, talk to your, uh, you know, audience when, when they are ready to, they're trying to interact with you as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and Facebook, I think a lot of people do find luck in Facebook. I just, I found just since it was such a political year last year, I just kind of avoided it. <laughs> and I know you, you do it, it, this, you create, you create the community you deserve. Basically like you are, if you interact with them and you're, and as you say, you, you, you work with, you know, as you mentioned before, is like, you know, responding and all that kind of stuff. And that that you kind of do you you you're able to you know foster those networks which i think is a good point but as you say it depends on um each one kind of does its own thing in a way too so 
It does. And a lot of people find success with Instagram. For me, I found a little bit of the square. Well, I mean, it doesn't really even have to be totally square anymore. Like you can crop a little bit more vertical now, but it is, um, I, I find it a little bit more restrictive and I can't mm -hmm. quite tag and sharing is a little bit more restrictive there, which is, is part of what is also nice and safer there too. You're not opening yourself up to like as, as a uh, possibly like frustrating of a discourse there. So, um, you know, it could be a very nice and safe way to, to start out. Right. Yeah. Social media is a crazy beast though. It, it, it really <laughs> is. I know. I know it's, 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 yeah. And it's, it's important to make sure that, you know, you're, you're using it and it's, it's not using you. So it's to keep yourself sane like that. Yeah. It can be really rough on your confidence too. You know, I, I think a lot of people go into it hoping that they're just going to, you know, instantly be praised for everything they put up there, but everything you're putting up can just as easily be torn down. You don't know who these people are because it's just faceless people behind, you know, sitting at home who, aren't necessarily going to take the time to treat you like a human and you have right. to be, you know, you have to be ready for that. Right. So it's, it's not always the best place. Yeah. <laughs> so would that, would that be like a recommendation is like, you know, kind of pick maybe one of them and just kind of foster a community through one Avenue that you feel most comfortable with. Yeah. And think about who you are. If, if you're a sensitive person, maybe, you know, work within private groups to make sure mm -hmm. that you're shielding yourself from, if you, if you don't feel like you're ready for it, then don't put yourself out there quite yet. Um, because there's nothing more discouraging. E even if it's not, e you know, even if it really is the best, the best thing you've ever made it, all it really takes is a, a little bit of, uh, you know, someone trying to tear you down because they're having a bad day. And you really have to, you have to have built your own confidence to know that you're okay with that. And to be able to turn, you know, shut that information off and, and just take the, the important, good criticism that you can actually learn from. Mm. And and so how did you connect with, uh, uh, how did you connect with the unlikely hero studios? Was that through the same group or how did that work? No, I just was, I, I was really searching for calls for uh, submissions. And um, I think I found them on Twitter again, uh, through different, call, you know, different advertising routes. So they were looking for uh, submissions for their, for their anthology. And okay. um and they uh, they just kind of hit right at the right time when we had the time to work on on a project and and submit it. You know, a big part of it is just the right place at the right time with comics. You can't, I think, I just with with every industry, I, I guess I, I shouldn't just say it's comics. You you know, you never know what's going to work when it's going to work. You just can't be discouraged when it doesn't work because it doesn't work all the time. Right. So I've seen a lot of these though that these these anthology things you've done you've worked with Stephanie on this yeah. one. Yeah. And then I think all three that we did, the COVID Chronicles one, and then the Mermaids, Andromeda. Do you, okay, so let me ask you, who's who's driving the bus here? Does Stephanie come to you and say, hey, can we do this? Or have you been able to go to Stephanie and say, hey, I got a great story. I got an idea. Can you write it for me? And then I'll draw it. How do, does that happen too? Uh, for the first one, it started with uh, Small Acts in COVID Chronicles. And I, I told her about it. And actually before it was in COVID Chronicles. It was in a different fundraiser that I'd heard about. Okay. Um, it was fundraising for the Geddes PPE project, and it was very, very early. And I just said to her that I, it was something that I, I believed in, and I really wanted to find a way to contribute in a way that I could contribute, but I didn't have anything to write. And I just thought <laughs> that, you know, I said, do you think you could could write something? And she said, sure. She's she's really great at always being up for a challenge. And uh and came up with something like that. I think she's just got a million ideas floating around in her head and she's just waiting for something, just waiting for, you know, whatever door and opportunities is, is going to take that, that next one. And it was, um, it, it just, it just worked well and it, it sparked a really great creative friendship. And uh, that was, that was really amazing because I've, I've worked with so many collaborators in the past where I think the hardest thing is you, you invest so much time. I mean, th there was, uh, you know, other writers in the past that I've worked with where I've done so many pages that never saw the light of day. And, mm -hmm. you know, even if you're getting paid for it, that's really disheartening, you know, and you don't, what do you do with it? You know, right. I'm do not in it for, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, you know, like the, the money is nice if you really need to pay bills, but it, it's, it's not really, you know, the end, the end goal. Mm -hmm. 
Would that be something though? Like, would, would that be a recommendation? Maybe it's like, you know, when you're negotiating a contract, uh, when you're negotiating a contract to say, Hey, I want to make sure that, uh, uh, after a certain amount of time, I can utilize these images for something else or. Yeah, I, I do think that's really important. And even for some of the, um, digital releases, you can actually have a clause where after a digital release has existed for so long, you can reuse it elsewhere. Um, which is what we did with the Get Us PPE project. Uh, from there to COVID Chronicles, the first story, Small Acts, a big part of it was that we invested time in it, but also it was you know, a story that was really dear to Stephanie's heart, especially mm -hmm. during the last pandemic. And so being able to put it into print where it could last much longer and, and help other people, that was really nice. Yeah. So that was all part of just making sure that the contract was well-written and and you weren't locked into anything. Right. Um, Stephanie just said that I'm sending him 10 more stories after this. So <laughs> she's got a graphic novel to write. She can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And oh, that was a note. And then Greg Giordano says, great work, Seth Martell. So there you go. Uh, your Twitter followers there. So thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, so what would be so? what would be some good places for artists to reach out to, to try to find a um, uh, samples of contracts? Where did you, how did you get in? How did you find out to what contract would be the best way to write? Is there certain online re resources that you would recommend? You know, there, there are great lawyers out there that you can hire, but for the ones that I had, I honestly knew it was just such low stakes for them. It just was really, we just carefully read them and, you know, having, just having help in your life so you're not just reading it by yourself is is really important uh, it really depends on how how serious of a contract you're trying to get into you know but by all means i, I think a lawyer is incredibly helpful when it gets to that next step like mm. what are you what's your end goal with this this comic and how important to you is it right. um what's you know what do you think the what's the legs on it you know do you think that you can use it again do you think that you do you think you're getting your money's worth for it? Do you think that you're getting like, and I don't mean like cash money. I, I really mean like, do you think that you're right. the time that you spent on it and how much you care about your story? Yeah. Good. So, um, talk to us. About, so was, was this, was elsewhere the first Kickstarter that you were a part of? It was, yeah, it, it was. And I've I'd always been kind of hesitant about a Kickstarter because I, didn't really know enough about how they work to really start it, you know, to get into it myself. And um, I think a big part of what what these guys did as a, as a group, they are really amazing at having, you know, fun, thoughtful stretch goals that their audience are really looking for, keeping momentum going, um, having a really diverse comics within the anthology that I think there's something for everybody. Right. And, um, you know, and also just making sure that they check in a lot along the way. And I have a huge amount of respect for people that are diligent and thoughtfully running something because there are so many people in comics that are unintentionally flaky. You know, they, mm -hmm. I don't think anyone means to be, but everybody gets caught up in their life and everybody gets caught up in so many things around them. But when you're running a campaign with so many people who invested time, right. having people who care and see things through you know, you just, you gain a lot of respect for them and you really want, like you want them to succeed as much as, as seeing yourself succeed because you know that there's, you know, a, a reciprocal investment happening. And, and you say also too, like that one of the, the, the benefits of doing a anthology through Kickstarter as well, does it help also expanding your, your readership and your, maybe your audience as well? Oh, heck yeah. I mean, like you think about it, every story has what, how much of a creative team and each one right. of them tells one person, that person possibly tells another, but if they tell two people, it just, it's exponential. And it's, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a really smart way to start small, you know, or mm -hmm. to start, you know, for, especially for new creators, I highly recommend anthologies because I've, I've bitten off graphic novels before that have, they've, they've gone all the way through, but there's such a, short-term learning experience that you get from working at Pentop with working within anthologies because the timelines are quick you're learning exactly how to budget your own time you're learning exactly how to budget your time with your 
co-creators too, you know, mm. if, if they have to get to a next step. In fact, Andromeda, we were going to have a colorist take care of it, but, you know, getting short windows of submission times, knowing that you have to make it, the colorist just didn't have enough time and I had to do it myself. Okay. And uh, yeah, you, you learn how, if, if that falls through, what, what can you, can you fix it yourself? Can you take care of it? Should it go without, you know, you, you can always go black and white, but what if the submission is for all colors? So you have to, you're juggling, but you're learning how to juggle only a few balls instead of, you know, chainsaws. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so this is great. So it looks like, so it looks like Seth, we're, we're, we're knocking on the top of our hour here. So as we mentioned before, the, the best place, uh, the best place for people to find you, would that be, um, your, you have your, your website, but also you have your, your Twitter is you utilize that a lot too, right? Yeah. Basically for Twitter, I just use it because it's such a quick way to, to reach me, but my website also has my email and it has, you know, easy contact information for me there. So it really depends on just what somebody's comfortable with. Sometimes with Twitter, you just want to just drop in and, and leave a quick, quick right. comment or a note and uh, an email might feel a little bit too intrusive or too much or, but if, you know, you just, someone just wants to leave me a quick DM or, or you know, a question or graphic design questions or anything about stories or anthologies, you know, by all means, please reach out. Yeah. Great. So looking forward to seeing more of, of the mayor. So uh, we, so we, we know that's, that that's one of your projects that you're working on, but no dates yet. You don't want to, you don't want to shoehorn yourself into anything specific yet. So. No, I got too much work left to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm excited. It's, 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 uh, you know, it's in a solid enough place that I feel like, you know, there's an end in sight, which is really exciting. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the pitching process is, is, is happening right now. And that's also a really exciting and scary time, but, um, yeah, who knows where it's really going to go from, from here, but, um, it's, is there, would there be any, yeah. So I'm, so now I'm curious. I mean, it's like, is there going to be some, now that you've kind of set up basically kind of a, um, a, a universe in a way where the story is, is there because of you, you've dipped, you, you've dipped your toes a lot in some anthologies in the past. Has there been a thought about maybe doing a mayor like anthology where you would have other writers and artists tell different side stories? Wow. That's really interesting. Um, I didn't think about it for this one because of like the way that I framed the, the, right. you know, the structure of it itself, but you, you could create an anthology about anything and find just so many cool, diverse voices out there. So yeah. I would recommend it. And if somebody does start one, I'd probably jump in on it. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much, Seth. This has been, this has been fascinating and I'm, and I'm super excited to, uh, you know, finally sit down and talk to you. Thanks, Marty. It was so nice to meet you. And I get it. And, and so, but the, so I see you always have your, I've seen this like Seth Christian Martel, Seth C. Martel. What's uh, what was your, what's your preferred? Uh, uh, it, it, there's really no preferred thing. It's just right. Seth Martel.com was taken up by a tech guy in Connecticut <laughs> for years. Darn so any, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>